Thank you so much for joining us here today. We're delighted to have you at Oxford. I wanted to start by asking about your new book. Can you just start by telling us a bit about it, what your motivation was for writing it, and what impact you hope it will have? Okay. Um, so this is, the book is mostly uh, a collection of columns. Uh, so things I've written uh, over the past 15 years, a few earlier pieces, um, but assembled to tell a story. Uh, with, with, uh, and it was a, it was a way, well, partly it was just a way of getting this stuff out. Also, it's an election year in the United States, and I thought it was important to get across the extent to which political debate in the U.S. is not actually between ideas that are held in good faith. Uh, there, there are actual you know, debates about real issues where reasonable people take reasonable positions, but those are almost never the important ones. The important ones are almost always ones where, where one side is arguing in clear bad faith. It's just clearly dishonest, uh, and evidence, doesn't matter how often evidence uh, refutes what they're claiming, they just stay with the same argument for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I had picked up um, some, many years ago, actually, from a, a paper on Canadian healthcare of all things, but the, the use, very useful term, zombie ideas. So a zombie idea is an idea that should have been killed by evidence many times, but it just keeps on shambling along, eating people's brains. And so that gave me the inspiration, let's, let's do a book that, uh, that takes columns that I've written over the past 15 years to talk about the, the role of zombie ideas in, in our political discourse and maybe help people little, think a little bit more clearly as we head into this very crucial election in America. So two of the main zombie ideas that you outline in the book are climate ch change denial and cutting taxes for the wealthy. Yeah. How have these ideas translated into policy and affected the economy over the past four years? And if allowed to continue, how will they affect the economy in the years to come? Well, OK. So just stay. The, in US politics, the, the clear, the, the, the dominant zombie idea is the idea that cutting taxes on rich people does, is, has miraculous economic impacts and pays for itself because the economy grows so much that revenues actually increase. Uh, and we've tested that over and over again. We've tested it with, with uh, the Reagan tax cuts, the uh, Bush, uh, Bush the Younger tax cuts, the, uh, the Trump tax cuts, tax cuts in Kansas. You know, we've done this again and again and again, and it's never, it has been wrong every time. Um, what it does is, I mean, it is, it does lead to budget deficits, although I think that those are not nearly as scary as people think, but what it, there, there's a kind of a two-step that goes on, a, a bait and switch, where first the conservatives in the U.S. ram through these tax cuts that explode the deficit, you know, claiming that they'll pay for themselves, and then the deficit goes up and they say, oh, in that case, we must cut, we must basically eliminate medical care for the poor. Right? It's a, so there's a, it's, it's, a, it's a process by which you, you sell tax cuts on false pretenses and then use the deficits as an excuse to basically make um, the most vulnerable societies of, uh, the vo most vulnerable members of society worse off. That's the, been the big effect of that zombie. The other one is climate change. And, um, uh, you know, at this point, no rational person can deny that, that we have a really, really big problem. It's, it, the, uh, the evidence has become absolutely overwhelming. Um, but 60% um, of Republican members of Congress outright deny that climate change is happening. They simply refuse say it's not happening at all. Um, and the rest, almost without exception, oppose any actual significant action to deal with climate change. And you ask, how can, they, how can that happen? Well, it's, uh, there's, a there's a whole industry of climate change denial, um, which people buy into, they buy into conspiracy theories. There's this vast international conspiracy of scientists to perpetuate the hoax that the climate, that, that the planet is getting warmer. Uh, and, you know, and then the consequences, obviously, uh, are that, that you know, without the United States, uh, significant climate change action doesn't happen globally. And this is existential. This could be the end of civilization. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, it, you know, it's hugely important, and uh, it's it's clear at this point that the the debate is not one in which it, that's susceptible to evidence. You're not going to convince uh, people who are essentially in the pay of the fossil fuel interests uh, that that they need to change their position just because uh, uh, Australia is burning. 
So like you said, people continue to believe these zombie ideas. How can we argue with zombies and have a constructive dialogue with those who refuse to accept um, oh. believe, uh, yeah. known facts? You, know, you, can't have an arg you cannot have a constructive dialogue with the people who are firmly wedded to these ideas. Uh, that's unfortunately, that's one of those things pe people tell me, why don't you try to reach out to uh, you know, Trump supporters? And that's, that's not, uh, that, sorry, that, that there's, if, if, if we were able to have that kind of discussion, we wouldn't be where we are. But there's a significant block of people who are under the illusion that we are having a rational discussion. Um, it's, uh, there's even a name now, particularly prevalent in the, in the news media, uh, both sidesism. Uh, so one of the, one of the oldest uh, uh, pieces in Arguing with Zombies is a, uh, an article I wrote during the 2000 election. And it was already clear that, that, that you know, all previous standards about requiring some degree of honesty in, in the campaign had, had been eliminated. And, uh, and I wrote that if, if a presidential candidate said that the earth was flat, the headlines in major newspapers would read, views differ on shape of planet. Um, and that's something you can argue with. You can hopefully uh, uh, get uh, news media centrists uh, uh, to understand what they're actually dealing with. And that's, so that's, that's where the margin of, of, of hope lies. I mean, it, it, I think, I think I, I've won some of that. I mean, I, it, when I, gosh, it, do people here even know who Paul Ryan was? But, uh, uh, right, and so when I wrote in 2010 that Paul Ryan was a phony, uh, that, uh, a flim flam man, that, he, that his, his pretense to care about deficits was just an excuse to cut social programs, um, I got outraged reaction from a lot of sort of mainstream media type. How can you say that about this fine, uh, clearly sincere guy? And I think at this point everyone Everyone agrees. Oh God, that man was was an obvious phony. Why didn't we see it? So I, you know, I, I think we win some of those arguments. Whether it's enough, is time will tell. And how are the zombie ideas or any other conspiracy theories affecting the Democrats, if they are at all? Look, um, conspiracy. Th I mean, there's a little bit of that stuff uh, within intra-democratic party stuff. I mean, there. I think there's a pretty, there's a fringe, mostly uh, Bernie Sanders supporters. There are, there are a few who see everything as, the, as this dark. Uh, I, I, back in 2016, uh, you can still find on Wikipedia uh, that, that my son was working for the Hillary Clinton campaign, which was interesting because I don't have a son. Um, <laughs> and um, so there's a little bit of that, but it's, it's, it's very fringe within the party. So you know, if you compare, climate denial is, the entire Republican Party is, is committed to climate denial. There are a few people like that. And there are, not all zombie ideas are conspiracy theories. There are other things. So I, all of the important zombies are on the right in, in the modern United States because that's where the money is. Uh, but there are some things. I mean, I, I, I think the idea that we cannot solve the climate crisis without a drastic reduction in the standard of living is something that uh, tends to be a, um, popular both on the right and some people on the left who, who, want, who want to believe that, that we need to, you know, uh, that consumerism and, and, uh, and economic growth uh, cannot persist if we want to save the planet. And that's actually, that's clearly wrong. It's, it's clear that, that the technology, the, 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 the margins of adjustment exist so that, that um, we can maintain pretty much, uh, actually, that we can actually continue to increase our standard of living while at the same time moving to a zero emissions economy. So that this uh, sort of, that we must go back to living in, in, in villages and, and weaving baskets or something to, to save the planet. That's, that, that is a kind of a lefty zombie thing, but it doesn't have a significant st constituency. That's not gonna move an election, whereas some of these other things will. Looking at the evolution of the Republican Party, you said that each successive Republican president makes the preceding one look good in comparison. Yeah. How specifically has the party developed since your time working in the Reagan administration, and okay. how have we gotten to the point today that you criticize as the zombification of the okay. party? So, but if people don't know this, I was in the Reagan administration, but sub-political level. I was a, so just a sort of essentially a, what here would be a senior civil service post. So I was the um, the uh, chief international economist at the Council of Economic Advisors, 
the chief domestic economist was a guy named Summers, Larry Summers. Don't know what happened to him. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, Larry and I uh, were both registered Democrats. We were also both 29 years old, by the way. Um, and, um, uh, and so I, I was able to do, now, people do romanticize each preceding Republican president. And so people talk as if the Reagan administration was still full of sensible, responsible people. Uh, and let me tell you, I was, my position was I was the guy sitting at, at, at behind the, the guy at the table, passing up little slips of paper, reminding him to say something. Uh, so, um, and there were a lot of strange people, even in the Reagan administration. I mean, I, I uh, uh, actually, I, I dealt on economic issues with the National Security Council, and they were, they were crazy as, as loons. And I thought, well, okay, economics isn't their thing. I'm sure the actual national security people aren't like this. And then came the Iran-Contra scandal, and it turned out the whole thing was, the whole, the whole NSC was crazy as loons. So, um, but there were some responsible people still. And there were still some responsible, there, there were Republican senators uh, happens to be something that, for complicated reasons, I have some personal um, uh, involvement with. When, when uh, uh, there was an uprising against uh, Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines, uh, Reagan's personal instinct was to back the dictator, was to be pro-authoritarian, but the, a bunch of Republican senators said, no, sir, America stands for defending democracy, you can't do that. There are no people like that left, or maybe, maybe there's Mitt, Rom Mitt Romney. Maybe we have one Republican senator left like that. But no, uh, so the, it, it's been a gradual process. The, you already had a fair number of, of uh, crazy people, purveyors of zombie ideas already. I mean, the tax cut zombie goes back to Reagan. Um, but you, it was a more mixed picture then. And then uh, you know, the uh, uh, George W. Bush, there were, it, it was worse, but there were still some people who were uh, somewhat rational. So, you know, um, but uh, uh, now, I mean, uh, put it the, uh, for those of you who do monetary policy, you know, uh, uh, Bush appointed uh, Ben Bernanke to head the Fed, and that's uh, and Bernanke is a uh, I've known him forever, but is you know, clearly a, a, a very reasonable person. Trump is now trying to put unbelievable hacks on the, on the Federal Reserve Board. So you can see that there's a, been a progressive process of, uh, of degeneration. The U.S. is currently close to full employment. Do you think that Trump's spending then amounts to positive stimulus? And where would we be if the Republicans had allowed Obama to engage in the same sort of de oh, deficit yeah. spending? Yeah, I mean, if we had, I, you can actually, I can put numbers to that. I've actually taken, we have some, I tried to make a point of using other people's numbers. So, it, so we, the, um, the Hutchins Center at the Brookings Institution has a measure of uh, fiscal uh, impulse, an uh, estimate of what austerity or stimulus has done to the economy um, quarter by quarter, uh, going back all the way to, uh, to the financial crisis. And you can say that if, um, if we had, provided fiscal stimulus at the rate that we are now providing under Trump all the way through Obama's term, the unemployment rate would have fallen below 4% by 2014. So we could have had this full boom, uh, you know, six years before we actually got to this point. Um, and it's, but Republican Congress would, you know, claim to care about debt and deficits and so they wouldn't let that happen. And of course, if Obama had been in a position to do it, uh, um, we, would have, we wouldn't have been running giant deficits to pay for corporate tax cuts, which the corporations, it turns out, are not using to invest. They're just using to buy back their own stock. Uh, we would have been using it to build infrastructure. We would have been using it to improve uh, child nutrition. We would have been doing things that actually were building the future. And in fact, we're doing none of that now. Actually, I was once, um, so I, I, I um, I wear a couple of hats, and I was in, a, in one meeting. Uh, Obama himself had a meeting of sort of progressive economists uh, just to, to chat. Uh, and uh, so I was there, you know, specifically not in my journalist hat. And, uh, the, um, and he said, I want to hear from you about ideas about things I can do. Uh, and they said, but don't tell me I should spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure. I know that. You know that. I can't do it. But of course, uh, if the Republican Congress hadn't blocked it, he would have. 
And looking at the rest of Trump's economic rhetoric in 2016, how much has he delivered upon, or rather how far have his actions fallen from his promises? Well, it's actually kind of amazing. Um, there, there are two things that are amazing. I always worry these that I'm going to keep on, then I'll come up with a third thing, uh, and it's going to turn into a, uh, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. But anyway, the, uh, um, but um, one thing is amazing. He ran in 2016 as a different kind of Republican. He said, I'm going to raise taxes on the rich. I'm not going to cut them. And I'm going to leave social programs intact. Uh, I'm not going to cut Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. And I'm going to invest in infrastructure. And um, he did none of those things. In fact, he cut taxes on the rich a lot. Uh, in fact, there's been a, he's been uh, doing everything he tried to, to massively cut uh, Medicaid and, and to massively cut health care for, for less fortunate Americans. And, uh, and this latest budget uh, suggests that he wants to go after Medicare and Social Security as well. So all of that was dishonest. Uh, there has been, I mean, in, in political um, circles, uh, infrastructure week. The Trump administration has declared it's infrastructure week maybe about eight times and nothing ever comes out. So, um, they, so he's been none of the things that, that he said he would be. So that's one side in which he has just, you know, he, oh, the, the, the tr Trump in practice has been absolutely no resemblance to the person he pretended to be in the 2016 campaign. Um, the other thing is the economy is strong. U.S. economy, you know, with low unemployment, uh, do uh, $300 billion of fiscal stimulus. That's what tends to happen. But it's really striking that the th specific things he tried to promote, tried to promote business investment with corporate tax cuts, but business investment has fallen. And he tried to promote manufacturing uh, with, with tariff, with trade wars. And uh, although the economy as a whole is, is looking strong, we're in a manufacturing recession. So it's, it's kind of an amazing performance. It, it, he's, he's managed to uh, have an overall picture that is, is you know, gratifyingly full employment, but everything that he has specifically targeted has gone down. Um, so that's, those, are, those are the things that are, are impressive about, about this. It's a, uh, the, the gap between uh, promise and reality is, is amazing. And looking forward to the rest of this year, what are the central policies that the Democrats can focus on and develop so that they have the best chance of beating Trump come November? Okay, so this is where, and you can have you know, bitter debates among Democrats. How, how much should they be pushing for dramatic new policies? And how much should they be pushing for defending what we have and maybe expanding on it? Um, and I like, I mean, I, it, I would like to see a big move in a progressive direction, but I suspect that politically, you really want to play on people's justified fear that they're going to lose what they have. So, you know, Democrats won big in the 2018 midterms, uh, mostly by running on Trump is trying to take away your health care. They should, he still is. They should be running on that and saying, running on, um, oh, and by the way, we're going to completely upend the health care system and replace it with single payer. Even if you think single payer is a good idea, which it probably is, is probably not a, a, a good way to run the campaign. So I, I, you know, Trump has given lots of ammunition in this uh, absolute betrayal of everything he claimed to stand for last time he ran should give Democrats an opening. And I, I worry that if the Democrats instead turn it into a referendum on radical new policies, however good those policies may be, that's a, a good way to lose the election. Looking to here to the UK, um, and the trade that the UK will be having post-Brexit, what do you think UK trade deals will look like and how easily will it be able to shift from non to non-EU trading partners? Okay, so let me do the second part first. Uh, the ability to shift to non-EU trading partners, that's, that's a delusion. That's just, um, uh, there, there, are some thing, there are some empirical relationships in economics that really work. And one of them is something called the gravity equation. I think we probably have some, right? The uh, trade, trade between countries is um, basically proportional to the product of their GDPs, which is the part of the gravity thing, um, and strongly inversely related to distance. 
It's a very strong thing. And uh, um, basically, global economics wants you to be trading with your neighbors a lot. And America, however much you might like to make deals with America, um, is 3,000 miles away. It's just not going to. It, it's just not going to be a substitute for for trade with neighboring countries. And also, by the way, um, trade between the U.S. and the U.K. is almost free as is. I mean, the tariff rates are very low, um, and cutting it. You know, so cutting a tariff from two percent to zero is not going to make much difference. What does make a difference is eliminating frictions. So the point, the, the reason that uh, uh, that Brexit is probably going to be costly. Is not the um, is not the whatever tariffs come in. Um, it is the uh, uh, the fact that you had frictionless flow of goods and services across the border, and now you have to have customs checks, and that just that just makes life significantly more difficult. Not you know it's not doesn't mean grass growing in the streets of London, but it means it means that that the economy gets a little bit poorer, and you are not going to get a a customs union with the United States. Uh, among other things, they're actually aside from the fact that it's just yeah, too too far and too big. Um, with, there, there's a <laughs> it's a peculiar. We don't have a we have a North American Free Trade Agreement, or you know now renamed, but basically Trump just stuck his name on it. Uh, but was the, it's basically the same agreement. Um, it's a free trade agreement, but not a customs union. And the reason it's not a customs union is that a customs union has to have a unified trade policy. Has to have the the same tariffs. You, the, you have to pay the same tariff whether you unload goods in Hamburg or Rotterdam. Um, uh, who makes that decision? Well, the EU has several big countries, and so you, you can sort of have no one dominant player who makes all the decisions. The trouble with NAFTA has been US, Canada, and Mexico. Either you give Canada and Mexico substantial power over the United States, which ain't going to happen, or you have what is basically just US, the US making the policy, which is unacceptable to the Canadians and the Mexicans. And we did the same thing. The UK tried to have a customs union, or uh, uh, there's only so far the UK can, can go with having a special relationship with the United States without effectively becoming a US protectorate. And uh, so, which, which I don't advise, right? So, uh, so it's not gonna happen. And sort of tying together uh, everything that we've talked about so far, why have both the policies of the Trump administration and Brexit not yet proven to be the economic catastrophes that they were predicted to be? Oh, you know, I, so I, I made famously a bad call, an emotional call on election night 2016, said there's going to be a disaster, which I retracted three days later. I said, you know, this, I, let, I did what, what you shouldn't let yourself do, which is I let my you know, political dismay color my analysis. And I said, well, actually, you know, if anything, Trump's going to run bu bu bigger budget deficits, and that'll give the economy a bit of a boost. So that was what the model always said. Um, and I was actually one of the f people who, who warned that the Brexit opponents were scaremongering, that you don't get instant gratification. Uh, what Brexit does, it doesn't cause a recession, things like that. Trade, uh, it's, uh, uh, what Brexit does is it puts some sand in the gears. It, it, uh, it creates frictions. It makes the British economy less efficient and therefore a little bit poorer, but not an instant economic catastrophe. It, it's, I think Adam Smith said there's a great deal of ruin in a nation. It takes a, particularly an advanced country with all of the capabilities and flexibility of yours or mine. Um, you, it takes years of really bad governance to, to, to do a lot of harm to the economy. Either that or a, completely, a complete failure to respond effectively when a crisis hits for other reasons. So I, I, if, if things go badly wrong, if, you know, who knows, maybe coronavirus will be the, 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 the testing moment, P probably not, but who knows, uh, then you worry a, a little bit that, the, uh, that you know, the Trump has surrounded himself with a team of idiots. But, it's, uh, the, um, the, but it takes a lot to, to really screw things up. Uh, uh, and the, uh, it never made sense to say that Brexit was going to cause a recession. Uh, it was always what, if, if you took your models seriously, and, and if you're in a conference, you really should, um, I mean, models are not, are not always right, um, but the one thing you should never do, which I f failed my own injunction for three days in 2016, is to let your, your emotions 
uh, cause you, if, if you have a, a really strong reason to think that the model is wrong, fine. But, but uh, and so the fact that people were, for a lot of reasons, horrified at, at, at Brexit was not a good reason to invent new reasons for a recession. And that's what I'm, I'm afraid some people did. You mentioned the coronavirus just then. We've already seen the effects it's been having on the Chinese economy, but as it spreads, what impact will it have on the global economy? Well, that's what we want to know. I mean, it's, um, it's, it depends on how, how big and how pervasive. I mean, the, um, so we had SARS, which was something similar uh, in 2002, 2003, which did, there was a measurable impact, not just on the Chinese economy, but on the world economy. It, it clearly did shave maybe uh, one or two tenths of a percentage point off global growth. But in 2002, China was 7% of world manufacturing. Now it's more than a quarter of world manufacturing. Uh, China is an integral part of supply chains all across the world. So if this is really disruptive, um, then it is, um, uh, it, it, it's going to be a much bigger deal than past ones. I mean, I'm hearing you know, anecdotal reports from businesses saying that there's some crucial raw material, uh, some crucial input that, that they normally get from their Chinese suppliers, and, and they've, they're about to run out, and they can't get any more. So this could be a pretty big deal, um, but it all depends on the epidemiology, of which I know nothing. Uh, and uh, actually, I'm afraid the epidemiologists are, are are kind of feeling that they know nothing because they can't trust the Chinese government. Uh, and so they can't trust the reports. Just a final few questions from me before we move to the audience. In your view, what has been the biggest disappointment in economic policy over the past decade? Oh. Um, no, it's actually it's pretty simple. I mean, they, there are lots of things, but the, but the most important thing was the, the, the crazy turn to fiscal austerity um, in 2010, 2011. I mean, you know, there we were with mass unemployment, um, record low borrowing costs for all major governments, uh, and suddenly the conventional wisdom, the, uh, a, I use a phrase in, the, in arguing with zombies, uh, uh, very serious people. I stole that from some, but it's a, I, I, you know, capital V, capital S, capital P. All the very serious people suddenly decided that debt was the greatest threat and that we should ignore uh, 30 million unemployed people across the Western world and, and instead worry about debt, even though our people with money on the line, people buying bonds, were clearly not worried about debt. And, um, and that did enormous harm. Like I said, in the U.S., we could have had full employment by, two, by 2014. Um, the U.K. suffered, it was a much more gradual process, but the U.K. suffered years of lost growth because of, of premature austerity. Um, in in, in, in Europe, people look and they say, well, because Spain is recovering, so it's all okay. You know, in the long run, it turned out all right. And this is where, that's, that's actually the meaning of the Keynes quote about in the long run, we are, we are all dead. I mean, Spain went through 10 years of hell and finally is emerging from it. But my God, the, the human cost is enormous. In some places, uh, Greece may never recover. So the, 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 the shift to austerity and the, the way in which elites decided uh, in the teeth of everything we knew about macroeconomics, that debt was the most pressing problem. That was the most disappointing thing I've ever seen. And leading on from that, what are the biggest challenges you think we'll face over the next decade in deciding economic policy? Okay. Um, so, um, I'm, a, a, I'm a secular stagnation guy, which is one of those economic jargon things that that nobody has any idea what it means. Uh, but, but secular stagnation says that you have, it's, it's when you have persistent weakness of demand, when the private sector just doesn't want to invest as much as it wants to save. Um, it, it, which means that the economy, it doesn't mean that you're always in a depression, but it means that you're kind of always close to one. And that, that if anything goes wrong, you don't have a very good way to respond. And that's where we are all across the, uh, the advanced world. Uh, we, um, I'm not sure what the next big shock is going to be. Maybe it's coronavirus, maybe not, maybe it's something else. But sooner or later, there's always a shock, and we don't have any shock absorbers anymore. Uh, interest rates are so low that central banks really can't do significant cutting. The U.S. is in the best position, but even so, we don't, we don't have nearly enough room to, to, uh, to respond to a recession. Um, you have even less, and the, 
and interest rates are negative in, in both the euro area and, and in Japan. Um, fiscal policy, we've already seen that, uh, that governments are very bad at using fiscal policy. Uh, they, um, and so there's no, it's not at all clear if something, I mean when, I shouldn't say if, sooner or later something will go wrong. And when it does go wrong, it's not at all clear how we'll respond. So if you ask me, when do I predict that the next uh, Great Recession is coming? The answer is I have no idea. But what I do know is that we're much worse placed to deal with a shock than we were in 2007. And final question for me before we move to the audience. Uh, globalization, to a certain extent, drew, drove a lot of the growth in the past decade in the world economy. But with the US withdrawing into more insular policies, what will be the main factor that drives global growth in the next decade? Okay. It, it's a real question. I mean, globalization was really, is really important for poor countries. Uh, you know, you, we, the, the U.S., if the U.S. turned protectionist uh, in earnest, which it has not, uh, it's just, you know, Trump is waging a limited trade war, um, then the U.S. would be a bit poorer. Uh, but access to global markets is really critical for a lot of the world's poor countries. I, uh, I always use as the motivating example uh, Bangladesh, just happens because it's, a, it's not a well-known story. People don't uh, uh, follow it very much, and Bangladesh is still desperately poor. And, you know, if, you, if you judge it by Western standards, it looks terrible, but it also has three times the per capita income it used to have. It used to be literally on the edge of starvation, and now it's, it's got some, some room, and it's all based upon being able to export labor-intensive products, mostly clothing. As somebody said, it's not, a, it's not a banana republic, it's a pajama republic. And, uh, um, and that, oh, those open global markets are absolutely critical for developing countries. Um, so far, we haven't done too much damage. I mean, Trump has imposed a bunch of kind of scattershot tariffs on Chinese goods. Uh, but China actually is, uh, if you were going to pick an emerging market that's able to handle that relatively well, it would be China. And a lot of the stuff that, that we blocked by tariffs from China, we're sourcing from Vietnam or Bangladesh instead. So it's not actually such a terrible thing for the world. And if, if that's how it stays, then, then we're okay. Then, then I don't worry. I mean, a, a, a full-on outbreak of 1930s style protectionism uh, would be disastrous for, I mean, it would hurt global GDP, but much more important, it would hurt a lot of poor countries that desperately need those uh, access to global markets. But I'm not sure that's going to happen. I mean, it looks to me as if, um, I mean, it, the, the, one of the funny things about Trump's protectionism is that it is not, there's not a strong political movement demanding it. There's actually not a whole lot of uh, constituency for it. Uh, it's, this is really one of the few things that is just his personal obsession. And, um, and it's not clear that that's a, a trend that's going to go on very, very much further than it has. Thank you. We'll move to questions from the audience now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come to you, and stand up while asking your question. And could we start with the member in the second row? in the white sweater. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering if there are any economic policies that uh, do not uh, hurt the climate and, and also appeal to the, Demo sorry, to the Republican base. Sorry, that would, would... Are there any economic policies that are good for climate okay. and appeal to the Republican base? Okay, you can make a distinction between the Republican base being like ordinary voters and Republican politicians. Um, and uh, and the, the, the quick answer for the pub politicians is no. Uh, there, there are people. Uh, that, you know, we've had, uh, there was an op-ed by George Schultz and Ted Holstead saying, let's, do, um, uh, let, let's have a carbon tax and rebate the proceeds to the general public. And this will appeal to conservatives as well as liberals. And everyone will be for it. And there's an economist letter that's signed by several former Republican chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors and every living form of Federal Reserve Chairman calling for the same thing. And they're all living in a fantasy world. There is nobody uh, in the Republican political establishment who has any interest in these things. They, they do not want 
it, it's not it, it's not about conservative principles or anything like that. It's uh, they they just do not want to acknowledge this phenomenon. Uh, for a couple, you know, they don't want to acknowledge first of all that the government can ever do anything good, because if people think that you know, if you see a successful climate change policy, then people might say, well, maybe we should also have um, universal health care. Um, and then, they, and then the, the, the grip of the fossil fuel interests. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's no way to deal with climate change that doesn't financially hurt people whose money is locked up in coal. So, um, no, it's uh, unfortunate. There, the idea that, you, that, that some clever twi tweak to the policy is going to get you Republican support is just... Uh, you, I, you might believe that if you've been in a cave for the last 20 years. Could we go to the member in the back row? Um, thank you very much uh, for your speech. I was wondering, do you think that there is a way back from the zombification of discourse, um, both in the US and the UK, or do you think that there are now too strong political, economic um, incentives for politicians to spread disinformation and continue to prop up a lot of these ideas which theoretically are sort of according to technocrats, completely dead, but still very much alive in the minds of the public through this kind of fake news and post-truth world? Okay, well, part of the answer is you cannot. And giving in to despair is just, is just the wrong thing to do, so you always have to hope. Um, and there are, um, you can, there are opportunities, sometimes, uh, a window opens up. So for, for many, many years, uh, significant uh, expansion of health coverage in the United States was just impossible. We, we knew it couldn't be done. And then a window of opportunity opened up um, in uh, large part thanks to the financial crisis, and we got it done. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's half a loaf but it's still 20 million people now have, health, have healthcare who didn't have it before. So, so you can get some things done. Uh, and then there's, uh, um, it, it's possible that, that things, uh, I mean, I, I'm trying to figure out what, what is going on on your political scene a little bit. And it seems to me that, that uh, Boris Johnson is a little bit like, uh, like Trump pretended he was. I mean, he, he is actually uh, um, calling for investment in infrastructure. It's not clear that it's, they're smart investments in infrastructure, but, it's a, but he does want to actually build some stuff. So that's a, that's a difference. So, so there is some room. I mean, the things where there's really big money involved, it's very hard. But there are some things, like the debt obsession. I think that, had, that was much more just a kind of self-reinforcing uh, uh, prejudice among, among elites, and, and those things, can can shift. They can they can change. But uh, I mean, who knows? Uh, the, we've, we we have had we have had political reforms in the past. There have been times when when policies got much better, and you just have to hope that we'll find uh, windows of opportunity to make that happen again. Could we go to the member at the end of the first row here? In the Sorry, here, in the first row. Hi. I'm curious to hear more about your writing process. Um, you have a knack for writing pieces, op-eds that are very succinct, very relevant, um, and really speak to direct kind of feelings or issues that many people have. Um, and more broadly, I'm curious what motivated you to branch out from academia into writing um, more publicly relevant, uh, politically related pieces. OK. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I had I had a sideline in occasional public writing from way back. I mean, I was a uh, I was a columnist for U.S. News and World Report in the 1980s. I never met anybody who read it, but uh, the uh, but so I'd, I'd had so, and by the way, it's terrible. I mean, my practice is really important here, um, and uh, so I. You know, I've always been less uh, techy, uh, less jargony than, than most people, even in my academic writings, uh, uh, always striving for maximum simplicity. Um, and then the actual, so, somehow that gravitated, and um, 
I got this offer out of the blue to write for the New York Times, which was nothing I was anticipating, but uh, just seemed like a chance to do something different. Um, and, but the actual process of writing, there, there, a couple of things. One is to, I'm always working. I'm always accumulating material. Uh, every time I'm, I'm, I'm on the, you know, uh, uh, on the web, on Twitter, uh, selectively. Um, the uh, uh, picking and anything that I think that might be useful, I, I you know, I archive. So I, I there's there's always a uh, a backlog of stuff that's ready, and then I pay attention to events and more, when it seems like that there's a moment when when it might actually uh, be useful to, to 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 write about something, and um, I'll do that, and then there. No, the process, there are rules for writing. Uh, uh, you, you always have to, um, uh, you know, I, I talk about them a little bit in Arguing with Zombies, uh, that, that um, uh, uh, stay with the easy stuff. You know, I, I, have, I don't believe I've written any columns about quantitative easing because uh, that's not a topic that, it won't, that, will, that will make any sense at all to, to, to the readership, uh, write in English. Um, and then um, the, um, uh, I, there are certain basic communication rules. I, I'm told that the military uh, system is tell them, uh, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. Uh, or as I sometimes say, you should write in sonata form. You introduce a theme, you do some stuff with the theme, and then you return to it at the end. Um, and, um, uh, got, and always remember that nobody has to read you. That's a very important thing that academics have trouble with. If you're writing for a newspaper, nobody needs to read you, so you have to have something to grab them at the beginning, and you have to have a stinger at the end so that they remember it. And even with all that, by the way, at the moment it's actually a little bit hard for somebody like me to break through. If you look at the most popular stuff in the New York Times on a given day, it tends to be impeachment, how to boil a perfect egg, grilling with mayonnaise, um, uh, 32 places to visit in Italy. So, you know, people are, uh, okay. <laughs> um, could we go to the member in the second row over there? Hi, thank you for talking to us. We've been speaking a bit about your expertise in international trade. I was just wondering if you might say something on your other big area, which is new economic geography. We've got a lot of inequality within countries and in the distribution of economic activity within countries in the US, in the UK, and in Europe. Particularly here, the policy responses to these problems, particularly the strength of London and the Southeast compared to the rest of the country. And the policy response seems to be, as you put it, build something. Um, what do you think new economic geography should tell us about how we can have a more nuanced and positive policy response to these issues? Okay, so I, yeah, this, this is one of my, you know, original, this is my old hunting ground uh, and that I basically uh, helped create the new economic geography 30 years ago and, um, and something happened, turns out, we didn't realize it, right away, but it's now clear that there was a break point somewhere in the 1980s. Up until that point, regional, uh, regional differences um, had been steadily narrowing. So the backward parts of, of advanced countries were catching up with the, more, with the richer parts, and that all went into reverse sometime in the 80s. And now you have the um, highly educated workers are migrating to places which already have highly educated workforces, um, the, um, you know, the, the, yeah, it's just been a, sh a shift uh, uh, toward, towards, um, there's a lot of left behind regions in all of our, in all of our countries. Um, and um, as best we can, we, we don't fully understand it, but it looks like it has something to do with, uh, for once, it, this, this is mostly not political. It's, uh, it, it's being driven by technology. Um, knowledge based industries want to be where lots of people with with uh, high technical skills reside and uh, that offer the amenities that those people want. Um, subtler things too. One of the funny things that you see is that corporate headquarters in the US, um, a lot of them had moved out of the big urban centers 
and now are, they're moving back in. And the reason they can do that is because they can actually physically separate the low-level jobs from the high-level jobs. It used to be that to have your corporate headquarters in Manhattan, you had to, have, you had to pay 5,000 people enough to, to, uh, to live given the cost of Manhattan real estate. Now you can have only 1,000 people, the, the top jobs, and the 4,000 other people can be somewhere out in, in, a, in a much cheaper location. So all of these things have... Now, it's, and it's, it's, it has definitely caused a lot of stress. I mean, the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, deaths of despair in the United States is of uh, opioids, uh, suicide, and, and alcohol is a huge thing. And it's very much a, something that's taking place in the left behind regions of America. Uh, the uh, um, lots of, of men without work. And by, I'm not being sexist there, but it's, you know, particularly it's the, it's the men without work that is, is, uh, that is, is, uh, is showing that something has, has fundamentally changed. Uh, and, um, the, um, and politically, those left behind regions are the ones that tend to be radicalized, uh, radicalized on the right, as it turns out. Uh, so that, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the popular vote was almost evenly split uh, in the United States in 2016, uh, slightly, uh, you know, the, the people made their choice and they chose Hillary Clinton. But then we have this electoral college thing. But the, uh, um, but uh, two thirds of, of the GDP uh, voted for for Clinton. It was the it was the prospering regions that that voted Democratic and the the left behind regions that voted Republican. So then, and uh, you know, so I can go on and on. I mean, you know, so if you look at uh, you know where is where is the AFD in Germany? I have to say, I'd never imagined that, that, that you know, neo-Nazis would become a force in, in Europe again, but there they are. And, um, the, um, and their, their core strength is in the former East Germany, which is very much a left-behind region. Um, now, the question is, what do you do about it? And that is really, really hard. I haven't got any good answers. I mean, you can give aid to lagging regions, um, but you know, we do that. It, actually, it turns out the US the U.S. we don't have regional policy except that we do, because in practice, given the that we have a, a federal government that is largely paid for by progressive income taxes, um, and that we have social programs that um, that are strongly redistributive, um, poorer, lagging states de facto receive huge aid. The state of Kentucky uh, effectively receives aid from the rest of the United States that's about 20% of GDP. And yet, that's votes, it, it votes for, for politicians who want to slash the government. So that's a whole lot. But anyway, um, and, but the point is that with all of that, the process of growing regional inequality is still proceeding. You can try to give, you, it, people point to examples, seeing so a successful, there are occasional success stories. Uh, that where a particular city, small city uh, in the heartland, uh, makes a comeback. But they tend to be isolated success stories. And I suspect that there's kind of a limited number of such success stories. That if, if, uh, if, if South Bend, Indiana, to take a random example, does well, it's probably because it, it, it grabbed a slot that might have gone to some other town instead. Actually, it turns out I, I grew up my early years in, in Utica, New York which you've never heard of. But it's in the middle, literally, it's, it's pretty much the middle of nowhere. And uh, was an industrial center and uh, suffered terribly, but has had a comeback um, because it's the headquarters of Chobani yogurt. And if you ask why did that happen, it's because in the mid-90s they accepted a bunch of Bosnian Muslim refugees. So it's just one of those stories where random events lead to, uh, but, but those are isolated stories. And, and the fundamental fact is that the draw of those big, highly educated metros is very, very strong. You know, when Amazon solicited bids for a second headquarters, they actually said, if, you, if your metropolitan area doesn't have uh, at least a million people and a highly educated workforce, don't even bother calling us. Could we go to the member over here in the first row? Hi. So you mentioned globalization and talked a bit about it. Yeah. 
and its importance in alleviating poverty. Um, but surely that alleviation is offset by the increased distance that goods need to travel and the carbon that they, uh, the c carbon emissions that are yeah. emitted by such travel. And so I was wondering, which issue do you think is more pressing, the need to alleviate poverty or climate change, or is there a way to address both? Thank you. Okay, um, that's actually a very good question, because if, if we do move to a, uh, if, we, if we have aggressive climate policies, which we, we, which we damn well better have pretty soon, um, the, um, uh, I've actually s sat through some presentations about the technologies here. So the biggest uh, source of, of disastrous emissions is burning coal to generate electricity. And we should stop that immediately, and it's easy. With the technology, uh, renewable technology has had a revolution, so that's easy. Um, local ground transportation, electric cars, you know, as we, we know how to do that, we'll get better at it, and if, if the electricity is generated by renewables, that's fine. The hardest parts, the hardest things to replace um, are air and, uh, and marine transportation. Those are the ones where we still, uh, uh, there aren't yet good technological alternatives to hydrocarbons. Maybe hydrogen, something, but we don't. It's, so it's likely that a world in which uh, we had, we put an appropriate price on emissions, which is only part of, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not one of those people who thinks that the carbon tax is the be all and end all of policy, but it's certainly part of it, uh, would be one in which international shipping would be substantially more expensive um, and it would cut into globalization. Now it's, Pro, you know, given past experience, uh, people may, may find innovations. So they, it's not necessarily the case that we have to do a lot, le a lot less global trade in order to control emissions, but it's definitely true. Marine transportation uh, is, is a really hard thing. It, it is one of the areas that we're, um, we don't have, a, we don't have a, a, a good zero emissions technology on, on, on tap. And it would be, it, it, it would certainly be at least initially a casualty of effective climate policy. That's, you know, saving the planet takes priority. Can we go to the member at the very end of the chamber? Um, you spoke earlier about these divisions within the Democratic Party and how refusal to compromise on progressive ideology will be a losing strategy. So I'm curious. In your opinion, what is the best message um, or strategy to unify Democrats right now who are extremely divided? Okay, I don't know. I mean, that's not my expertise, right? And uh, it's not clear that's anybody's expertise. But uh, you know, I actually sit at the a, a, a center, uh, the Stone Center for the Study of Socioeconomic Inequality, which is genuinely interdisciplinary. We actually have sociologists, political scientists, as well as economists, and we actually talk to each other. So I actually take seriously, I'm not one of those economists who thinks that we know everything uh, and, and don't need, actually, I, sorry. Um, uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, a great trade economist, was my teacher, and he once explained, he said he was allowed um, to, to do this, his personal theory of reincarnation, which was that if you were a good economist, a virtuous economist, you were reborn as a physicist, and if you were an evil, wicked economist, you were reborn as a sociologist. Uh, uh, that's, that's a typical economist attitude, but I don't share it. And the, so I talk to the political scientists, but they're not at all clear on, on how, how this works. I suspect it's going to be, um, I mean, I'm going to be you know, f urging Democrats to unify behind whoever it is. That it, that the stakes are too high, and, and it doesn't, and, and, and the outcome is probably pretty much the same regardless, but anyway, the stakes are too high. Um, we may have some problems if, uh, you know, it uh, uh, does look like Bernie Sanders has kind of a hard floor of 24% support and a hard ceiling of 26% support, and that may, be a, may make it a little bit difficult to, uh, to unify the party behind him. Um, and then if, if if we end up, which we might, with somebody like Michael Bloomberg, some, some of the Sanders people will scream bloody murder. You know, up there, here's a plutocrat. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I think all we can do is try to argue to people, look, the, these, thing, these things are in the scale of what's at stake unimportant. Uh, I'm not a, yeah. Uh, um, 
I, I, I would, and maybe, maybe, still, we, it, we can come up with somebody who is kind of acceptable to all camps, uh, but God knows. We have time for one final question. Could we go to the member? What do you believe will be the largest long-term challenge to the American economy? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> it depends on how long-term we're talking about. I mean, for, for the next decade or so, the, it's, it's this lack of shock absorbers. Uh, I mean, it, inequality, is a, inequality is a really bad thing, and the rise in inequality is a really bad thing, but it doesn't, it's not exactly, uh, it, you can have a, an extremely unjust economy that, that doesn't have a recession. So, so the, the biggest, I think, thing right now is that, you know, in, uh, on average, when recessions hit, uh, the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates by 500 basis points. The current federal funds rate is only, I think, 150, 175 basis points. Anyway, it's a one, they, we, we have only about a third as much room to cut as we have cut rates in a standard recession. So we don't have a good response when, when something goes wrong. That's the, that's the kind of next decade. But beyond that, it's all climate change. I mean, climate change is the absolutely overwhelming issue of our time. And, um, um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, U.S. economy will, uh, will suffer once Florida is all underwater, you know, it's, uh, which, is, which is not that remote a prospect. And, uh, and of course, my, many more things, lo lots of stuff before that, once the entire Southwest becomes a desert. Uh, uh, so, but that's, that's everybody. Is uh, in the I, I do say in, in arguing with zombies that that uh, sometimes I wonder how I can justify writing about anything other than climate change. Could it, it is the existential issue out there. The trouble is, given political realities, you have to you you have to talk about other stuff because that's uh, 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 marching around with a sign saying the end is nigh doesn't work, even if it's true. On that note, that's unfortunately all we have time for. But please join us in heading over to the Goodman Library for a book sale and signing of Arguing with Zombies. And please join me in thanking Dr. Kroonring for coming here. <laughs>